I'm Sevil Mikhailova. And I'm Claude Sohani, and this is This Week in Focus. And this week we will focus on the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. What is being done to try and reach a solution after more than two decades of ongoing uncertainty? 23 years. This is a long period of history and this is a long period for the conflict resolution as well. But still there is no solution, unfortunately. And too many uh, hindrances, too many obstacles created uh, on the other side of the front line, which in fact impedes the conflict. And as a result, the nations, the peoples of the two countries are suffering. That's true. And uh, actually, 23 years in, in the life of a country is not long at all. It's, it's, it's a fraction of a second, but it's long in the lives of the people who are alive today and who are touched by exactly. this, who are touched by this, by this uh, conflict. People who have lost their homes and, and their lands and, and their jobs and their families. They, they are looking for a resolution to, to this ongoing side. And uh, on the Armenian side as well, there, there's, they, they need to, to find resolutions to the people who are living in the, in the homes that are not initially theirs. So it's, it's, it may well take another 23 years. Why it is so difficult to resolve the conflict? What are the reasons impeding this conflict resolution process? Well, when, when you look at a conflict, uh, and, and I've studied conflict resolution, I can tell you that it, it, it's much more complicated because you have to look at the whole picture at once. And what is the whole picture? The whole picture is not just the immediate Armenians, Azerbaijanis facing each other off on the line of contact. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are deeper issues that are involved. It goes as far as, as, as going into the what generated this conflict, what generated it, and usually it is ignorance of the other. Ignorance leads to fear of the other. Fear leads to hate of the other. Hate leads to fighting the other because you're afraid of him. And sometimes it may be completely irrelevant. Sometimes there might be a good reason. Uh, and one exercise is when you get two sides and they say, we have absolutely nothing in common, I will not talk to him, I have nothing in common. You give him a piece of paper and you say, tell me what are the three most important things in your life. And they'll put security, my family, um, safety, let's say. Mm -hmm. The other side will do exactly the same. It's, it's uh, you know, what, what you want for, for your side, the other side wants for him. Uh, see, Claude, for 23 years the parties, in fact, sit at table of talks numerously. Yes. And on the top level and on the uh, lower level, a little bit lower level, on the level of communities, yes. on the level of, uh, let's say, military. But there is no resolution. Yes, absolutely. Because you have to, to, to discuss the whole, uh, all, all the issues. What are the issues? The issues are the existing issues. What, what, how do you resolve the existing issues? The, the, the soldiers that are there, the, the homes that have been destroyed, who, who gets to pay for what? How do you address the, the issues of, of distrust, mistrust between the two communities? How do you... It's, it's, it's all... I mean, when, when, when you discuss conflict resolution, you do what is called a mind map. And the mind map is you, you map out all the different elements. And when you're finished, it is, it is mind-blowing because you don't initially realize that there's so many things that need to be discussed. And you can't do one today and the other tomorrow because it's like, it'll, it's, it's like the, 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 the zombies in, in, in the horror movies. They, they rise up again as soon as you stab them. You have to destroy them all at once. You have to address all the issues but at once. As time passes, I think it becomes more and more yes. difficult to yes. find a solution. Yes. So, uh, it, it, so to my mind, ten, 10 years ago, it will be yes. easier to find Absolutely. a solution. And now the hatred gr Absolutely. increases, grows, Absolutely. and uh, there is um, increased military spirits yes. on both sides of the front line. So one side yes. uh, looking for his house, mm -hmm. one side looking for his native land. Yeah. I mean, in this case, yeah. Azerbaijan and the next side, so not to give what it has, and it has is very difficult, in a very difficult yes. way. And we are joined tonight by uh, the spokesman for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Azerbaijan, Hikmat Hajiyev. Uh, my first question to you is, um, this conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh has been going on for 23 years now. Do you see any reason why it, you think it might achieve, we, we might have a resolution this year. You know, I would refrain from putting any concrete timeline for that because, uh, as you mentioned, negotiation is going on more than 20 years and with uh, the March 23rd, we are uh, going to, uh, it, it's actually 23 years now past since the establishment of the OSC Minsk Group co-chairs uh, institution and therefore it's quite difficult to put a concrete timeline uh, in this process, but we are committed to the negotiation process to sort out Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan-Nagorno-Karabakh conflict based on the principles of international law and particularly 
uh, within the territorial integrity, sovereignty, and viability of the internationally recognized borders of Azerbaijan. The OSCE has, has been involved from, for a while in, in trying to negotiate uh, some sort of, of a of solution to, to this crisis. Um, they've formed something called the Minsk Group, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. Um, do you think that there should be changes made within the OSCE or the Minsk Group? Because, in fact, they have achieved very little, if I may say so. I mean, currently, the issue is not about the changing the format of the Minsk Group or changing the members of the Minsk Group co-chairs. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, Azerbaijan is uh, continuously supporting this issue that all members of the Minsk group should contribute to this process and all members should also actively take part in the negotiation process. And in the meantime, another issue is that it's not about the changing format, but within the format, co-chairs should redouble their efforts to uh, push forward and particularly to implement the agreements and arrangements that we already have in the negotiation process. The most important and key element now we have with a comprehensive peace agreement. Azerbaijan expressed its readiness to start working and negotiating comprehensive peace agreements and even uh, starting to establish working groups on different aspects of the peace uh, agreement and having a structure of negotiation in this process. But from Armenian side, we see that different pretexts Armenian side trying to put forward so that to deviate from the core issue of the peace uh, agreement issue. Therefore, OSCE Minsk Group co-chairs currently should redouble their efforts and it should have a targeted messages towards the Armenian side so as to bring Armenia towards a constructive line in the negotiation process. Uh, let me follow up with, with, with something here. Don't you think that um, the three members, uh, United States, Russia and France, who make up the Minsk Group, um, Russia has very vested interest in, in, in maybe not seeing the conflict resolved too soon? And the uh, United States and France have very strong Armenian lobby groups operating in their countries. Would you not like to see perhaps a uh, more friendly country to Azerbaijan, say Germany, join the, the Minsk group? I'm um, afraid I may uh, disagree with you on that issue, because Azerbaijan enjoys excellent relations and very good relations with uh, all of the three countries, sure. and Russia is a neighboring country, and there is a strategic partnership relations between Azerbaijan and uh, Russian Federation. And Azerbaijan-France relations are evolving on a continuous basis. Uh, we have a promotion, the process of promotion of Azerbaijan-France relations. And of course, with the United States in the early days of Azerbaijan's independence, the United States contributed to strengthening of independence, sovereignty of Azerbaijan, and major oil contracts also uh, developed with the close support of the United States. But uh, in this process, we also see that this OSC means group co-chair countries in their capacity as co-chairs, these countries in one way or other contributed to the negotiation process. And we can highlight the three major elements that happened last year, for example, 2014. We have in 2014, in August, we have the uh, meeting of the presidents, uh, convened and initiated by the Russian president. And then we had a meeting in Wales with the uh, uh, participation and initiation of uh, uh, State Secretary uh, John Kerry, and in Paris, uh, we had uh, the meeting that initiated with uh, Francois Hollande, and there was a positive, indi positive indication in the negotiation process. But the, another matter is that as Armenia is trying to, in, in, based on its destructive policy, to obstruct the negotiation process. The problem is over there, and our expectation is from the OSC Minsk Group for chair countries that they should they, uh, use their influence upon the Armenia to uh, positively affect the negotiation process. And uh, there's also another uh, point. So Armenia continues to ignore the international calls on the release of Azerbaijanis who are taken hostages uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, were illegally uh, convicted uh, by the separatist regime of Nagorno-Karabakh. And uh, in fact, uh, the international community recognizes the illegality. Uh, and they, re they don't recognize the decision of the court of the court of appeal and court of the first instance as well. But Armenia ignores still. So what uh, does the foreign minister do in this respect? And first of all, I would like to uh, highlight the position of Azerbaijan foreign minister and Azerbaijan governments on this issue that uh, we, uh, this uh, so-called court doesn't have any legal status and yes. the, any decisions or verdicts uh, that this court claims couldn't have any legal uh, meaning and these decisions couldn't have any legal meaning. Uh, secondly, our uh, compatriots and these two gentlemen have been taken hostage by the Armenian armed forces and taking civilian personnel and civilian persons by the armed forces of another country is a direct violation of the Geneva Conventions and international humanitarian law. And therefore, Armenia directly bears responsibility for this action. 
And therefore, our demand from Armenian side is that to abide by its commitments under the uh, international humanitarian law and Geneva Convention, particularly to guarantee the release of uh, our hostages. And we are uh, continuing our coordination and cooperation uh, with the international community, particularly with the OSC co-chairs and uh, OSC co-chair countries and co-chairs themselves also raised up this issue in front of Armenia and as a meantime high-level officials from co-chair countries and the recent one was Victoria Nuland from the State Department she also raised up issue in Armenia but unfortunately from Armenian side we see complete disregard to the call of the international uh, community also complete disregard to the international humanitarian law but we will continue our coordination and contact with the international community on this regard and also, these people, in fact, were in their own native lands, which Armenia takes under control. Absolutely. It should also be highlighted that under what reasons, first of all, the one issue is that Kalbajar. Kalbajar is occupied territory of Azerbaijan. That's sort of one issue. And secondly, what Armenian armed forces are doing in the occupied territories of Azerbaijan, and particularly uh, we are talking about the Kalbajar region, and there is a particular UN Security Council resolution uh, condemning occupation of Kalbajar. And... Based on this, all of the two illegal aspects, Armenian armed forces conducting the third one, and they're taking civilian Azerbaijan persons as an hostage. Uh, and also, uh, so we'd like to note here illegal visits to Nagorno-Karabakh, this region, where, so, which is part of Azerbaijan, which is internationally recognized territory of Azerbaijan. But unfortunately, uh, many uh, foreign, many foreigners are visiting this land without permission of the Azerbaijani government. So, particularly the, for, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, recently, the minister made a statement saying that uh, so these visits were limited, so they, uh, in fact, uh, fall in the number. But still, I mean, it makes a controversial uh, statement saying that, saying that uh, they are making big profits uh, from these vi visits. How could you comment this fact? Uh, actually, Armenian comment saying that they are making profits, it's uh, ridiculous, really. And uh, there is a one gentleman, so-called uh, tourism department director or whomever, and he said that uh, in last year, Armenia uh, made... Uh, 6.4 million US yeah, dollars yes. revenues from these tourist activities. It's really nothing and it's a ridiculous figure. Uh, that's from one perspective. And secondly, let's say conceptually, illegal visit to the occupied territories of Azerbaijan. The major uh, 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 branch of the people who are uh, visiting occupied territories of Azerbaijan, mm -hmm. these are the citizens of Armenia. Armenia using uh, this as a statistics so what to bring it uh, to, to the attention of the international community as if uh, the citizens of another countries visiting occupied territories of Azerbaijan. That's uh, one aspect. And secondly, uh, the second major visitors are the members of the Armenian diaspora. And the third major group, uh, these are the people who are the, under the influence of Armenian diaspora. And beyond that, uh, most of the time, people simply don't know. And uh, due to the certain uh, uh, misunderstanding, they were brought to occupied territories of Azerbaijan by Armenia, as if they are visiting another part of Armenia, and they ended up seeing that they actually in the occupied territories of Azerbaijan. But procedurally, and we have a lot of uh, appeals to Azerbaijan aside from this uh, group of the people, and they understand the situation, and therefore they are expressing their support uh, once again to the territorial integrity, sovereignty of Azerbaijan, and uh, their respect to the laws of Azerbaijan, and they are also asking for to be uh, removed from this, uh, the list of uh, illegal, uh, uh, the list of the persons who are declared undesirable visitors to the Republic of Azerbaijan. Therefore, we see the tendency of decreasing the number of the people who are uh, illegally visited uh, occupied territories of Azerbaijan. Just uh, statistics are speaking for themselves. Uh, for example, uh, in 2013, when we initially declared this process, and there were 370 uh, people uh, in uh, Asana declared undesirable persons. Now we updated uh, the list, and now we have uh, around 424 people. Just within almost one year, uh, we have only increased about talking about uh, 60, 70 people. But before, but because of the Armenians' propaganda and different information campaigns they used, there was a little bit intensity. But we see that uh, continuously decreasing the number of the visitors of visiting occupied territories of Azerbaijan. When uh, you, you mentioned that the Armenians are going, okay, well, there's nothing we can do about Armenians going, unfortunately. But uh, when it comes to officials and, and, and journalists, and journalists for, especially who are usually trying to save money, um, if they, they get to go to uh, occupied territories through Armenia, 
they don't think that they need to go and get a visa, which is not going to give them any greater access through Azerbaijan. Don't you think that you're, you're, up, you're putting a number of people on, on a blacklist that shouldn't be, and, and they should be encouraged to go visit to see for themselves what's going on there? I mean, I, I'm relatively new to this to this issue, so but I, I, that's the way I, I, I would see it. I'm curious what what you think about that. I feel there is a practical solution from Azerbaijan side. We are very pragmatic and open uh, from our side, and we also acknowledge that journalists and also people from the academia should conduct their professional work, and maybe they're interested on uh, Armenian Azerbaijan conflict issue, and they should simply make that coverage. But there isn't a practical and legal solution for that. And I can uh, provide you with one best example. New York Times newspaper uh, representatives, and they simply wanted to make a coverage about the Armenian Azerbaijan conflict and uh, or the situation on both sides of the issue. Okay. And they visited Azerbaijan, and they also made a written appeal to the Foreign Ministry of Azerbaijan, and saying that we would like to make a journalistic and professional work in the occupied territories of Azerbaijan, but we are abiding by the laws and regulations of Azerbaijan, and respecting territorial integrity and sovereignty of Azerbaijan. And based on that, Azerbaijan gave its permission, and we also provided them with our accreditation cards, as it's provided for foreign journals, and they made their coverage in Azerbaijan, and they also made the same coverage in Azerbaijan, but in the occupied territories of Azerbaijan. Simply, there isn't a solution for that. And there is another gentleman from the United Kingdom, he's a researcher, and he also made the same trip to the occupied territories. And we have, an, on a continuous basis, such kind of an appeals. But before, maybe some of the journalists were not aware about the uh, procedures, about the issues. Therefore, we are also raising the awareness uh, of this issue, which is uh, crucially important. But uh, in the meantime, uh, it's also our appeal to international media, journalists, academicians, and some other people who would like to visit our territories or to conduct their professional activities, but they should abide by the laws and regulations and procedures of Azerbaijan. Uh, as you mentioned before, uh, so 23 years, this is a long term, and 23 years this conflict is on scene, and there's no resolution, unfortunately, to the conflict, and uh, so the obvious uh, factor is that Armenia is taking an unconstructive position, and today it was once more uh, confirmed. So they are, are actually not going to sign a big deal, a big peace deal with Azerbaijan. How could you comment this fact? Uh, really, uh, it's uh, disappointing and it's frustrating uh, for Azerbaijani people, first of all, and first particularly for the refugees and uh, internally displaced persons exactly. uh, of uh, Azerbaijan, and their demand is simply to return to their territories and to their homeland. Uh, it's also unfortunate that in 1992, in additional foreign ministerial meeting at that time of uh, OSCE, uh, Helsinki uh, meeting, there was a decision to convene immediately and as soon as possible, Miss Conference. That, that decision was in 1992, and unfortunately at that time, because of the lack of political will, lack of political determination, and there was not uh, the opportunity to convene Minsk Conference. And in 1992, most of the territories of Azerbaijan were not occupied at that time, and uh, there was not uh, such a big humanitarian catastrophe that we have witnessed as a result of Armenian further occupation of Azerbaijan territories. And then we have in 1995, the OSC means group uh, institution was uh, formed based on the Budapest, uh, Budapest uh, foreign ministerial meeting decision. And since then, really, we don't see concrete results of the negotiation process. And we see the concrete result of this negotiation process is the elimination of facts of occupation and aggression against an Azerbaijan and guaranteeing territorial integrity, sovereignty of Azerbaijan, and also ensuring return of Azerbaijan refugees and IDPs to the occupied territories of Azerbaijan. But the most, most of, uh, important precondition here, as it's demanded by the United Nations Security Council resolutions and also supported by the OSC Minsk Group for Chair countries, is the uh, removal of Armenian or withdrawal of Armenian armed forces from the occupied territories. The military factor and factor of occupation and aggression shall be removed from this process, and then uh, we can uh, have the breakthrough in overall negotiation process and guaranteeing peace and security in this region. So conflict resolution, as we know, is a very long uh, process. Sometimes it takes years, sometimes it takes decades. So uh, what, what scenario would be suitable for Azerbaijan, uh, so ex ex along with the factors that you mentioned before? In diplomacy, we always refrain from making any forecasts and speaking about the future. And in diplomacy, likes to speak about the current terms. 
In current terms, Azerbaijan is committed to the negotiation process, okay. but this negotiation process is not an open-ended process and shall not be open-ended process. There is a simple passion of Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan also declared in the UN General Assembly uh, meetings that Azerbaijan is engaged in the negotiation process, but bearing in mind its rights under the United Nations Charter, particularly the Article 51. Uh, Article 51 also guarantees right for the self-defense. Uh, that's also one issue. But still, we consider that the opportunities for peaceful resolution of the conflict is not, uh, are not exhausted. But uh, Armenian side should uh, think about the current situation. Armenian side should also think about the uh, future, uh, uh, about the future of this country, and this country is facing political, economic, financial, demographic, and some other crises. And simply, they should think about that: how they are going to see their future in a self-isolated situation, and having the problems and claims against all, or almost all their neighbors. And uh, under these circumstances, they should really think seriously think about the peace. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Anyway, having said all this, uh, uh, we will leave you with uh, our usual wishes of a better tomorrow. Goodbye.